Hello, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, even though I was already introduced, I feel I should introduce myself. So, hi, I'm Lia. Here's a fun fact you might not know about me. Uh, I'm originally from Greece, and I specifically grew up in the island of Lesbos, which technically makes me geographically lesbian, one of the very few you'll ever meet. <laughs> in other news, I like making stuff. All of my work is on GitHub, almost. Uh, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group. Uh, my day job is doing research in HCI at MIT. HCI is just a fancy academic term for usability. And I've written a book, uh, shameless plug, you should totally buy it. Actually, I think we have five to give away today. Uh, so the five, the five best questions, if we have time for questions after the talk, we'll get it. Otherwise, just the, the five first people that will meet me at registration. So enough about me. CSS variables. Uh, so the first variable that we ever got in CSS was act actually came a few years ago, and it was called current color. Not many people think of it as a variable, but I think it was the first variable we ever had. Current color looks like this. It comes from SVG, and it always resolves to the value of the color property. So if I change color here to something else, you can see how current color updates, how I have this radial gradient, and it also updates alongside as my, CSS, uh, as my text color. So CSS variables are a new specification that is kind of like current color and steroids in a way. They look like this. They start with two dashes. And let's say, let's give it a name of color and a value of F06, which is my favorite color. And we call it with the var function. So you might be wondering why this terrible syntax. I mean, let's face it, it's pretty bad, right? So the reason. Um, we went with this is a uh, existing CSS parsers did not have to change anything that can parse any CSS property can also parse CSS variables. It's just the same syntax. We didn't want to use the dollar syntax because we want people to be able to use preprocessor variables alongside with CSS variables because they serve different purposes and it's not one or the other. Both of them are useful on the same style sheet. Actually, most of this talk is about things you cannot do. Actually, all of this talk is about things you cannot really do with SAS with preprocessor variables. So here, if I change this variable, as you can see, my color changes as well. And I should add the reference here. Let's make it green. As you can see, it updates. You might be thinking that's not particularly exciting. You can do the same with current color and with much less code. However, let's define another variable. Let's call it corners and give it 15 pixels. So I can go here in my color stop and say calc 100% minus the value of my variable. And now I can change the size of the corners, and it just updates. And you might still be not particularly impressed because, hey, I could have done that directly in the color stop. So what's the whole point here? And you can do this with SAS variables. However, let's take this away from here and put it in our inline style. And it works exactly the same way. Try doing that with SAS variables. And of course, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, that was early. Uh, and you can also set it with JavaScript, as we'll see later on in this talk. And if you, if you combine CSS variables with JavaScript, you can do a lot of cool things. So the first takeaway is that CSS variables work exactly the same way as normal CSS properties. Actually, the dash dash syntax comes from the idea that variables are kind of prefixed properties without a, with an empty prefix. You know these dash WebKit dash properties? So WebKit is the prefix in those cases. CSS variables are properties with an empty prefix. So here we have a simple uh, HTML structure, just three divs with one child each. Uh, they each have, uh, every parent has a class of block one, block two, or block three. And what I want to show you in this case is that CSS variables actually inherit. So I have defined that my outline property always gets the value of the outline variable in every single element. As you can see, the selector here is the universal selector. But specifically on block one, I've, defined, I've given a value to my outline variable, 0.2m solid. And as you can see, if I change it, my outline changes in both of these divs. Of these divs. So you might be thinking, wait a second, I've only specified outline on, on block one. 
block one's just apparent here. Why did this div get an outline? And the reason this div got an outline is that, is that CSS variables are inherited. Of course, if I only want to specify it in the inner div, I can do this. So you might be thinking, I don't really want this behavior. It's not always convenient. So you can cancel it by setting outline, your outline variable to initial on the universal selector. And as you can see, this cancels inheritance. Uh, your variable is not inherited anymore. The reason is that uh, CSS rules that apply directly to an element always have precedence over CSS rules that are inherited. So by, by declaring that your variable is initial, and initial is basically the, the same value that a variable has before you give it a, any value. Uh, so by declaring it as initial on the universal selector, then if you don't explicitly give it a value, then it doesn't have one. Of course, you can still explicitly inherit in cases where you really, really want to inherit by using the variable and giving it the inherit keyword as a value. So you can have your cake and eat it too. So the second takeaway is that variables are inherited properties, not just any properties, but you can change that if you want to, which is useful in many cases. So at this point, you might be thinking, hey, you know what would be a cool use case for variables? Images. So you have something like this. Your background already works. And you might be thinking, I'll define an image variable with sad as its value. And then I'll go here and concatenate this with my image variable. And then I'll have my URL. But it didn't work. It would have worked in SAS. Why doesn't it work with CSS variables? And at this point, you might be just trying random things. So you might think, I'm going to put the entire URL here. And let's see, does this work? So, And you might try to do this. But this doesn't work either. So then you might be completely desperate, and you might try this. <laughs> and this doesn't work either. So why? Why did no, none of these things that we tried worked? So this doesn't work because of a Chrome bug. Our last attempt is supposed to work. It should work per spec. And actually, if I use an absolute URL, let's get our URL here. So now it works. It's a Chrome bug. Let's, oh, what happened here? Why can't I make it? OK. So let's go back to our relative URL that we had before. And let's go back to our previous attempt. And so this was our second attempt, if you remember. This didn't work either. Why did this not work? So the reason this didn't work is that, yes, you can use CSS variables in every CSS function. We saw them already in Radial Gradient, except URL. URL is the only exception where CSS variables don't work. And the reason they don't work is that URL is kind of an exception. It has special parsing rules because you can provide URLs inside it with or without quotes. So it's trying to basically it's parsing this. It's trying to parse this as a URL. Then it sees that it has a par an, op an opening parenthesis, and it drops the entire declaration as invalid. So that doesn't work. And the reason that this didn't work our initial attempt, which would have been so useful for m so many cases, is that A, you cannot use variables in URL, as we've seen, but also you cannot concatenate strings in CSS. You might be thinking of the content property where you can do things like that, and you can, you can concatenate strings by just putting them next to each other. You cannot th do that anywhere else in CSS. It's not a CSS concept. It's just how the content property works. Eventually, we will add probably an alias to the URL function so you can use variables inside it. And we'll add a way to do concatenation, probably a concat function or something. But right now, sadly, there's no way to do this. So CSS variables plus URL equals oh, chocolate ice cream. <laughs> there's a bug in Chrome where if emojis are above a certain size, they disappear. And I had zoomed in my slides. So some more WTFs, because this is CSS after all. As you might expect, an empty value is invalid. If you, if you define a variable and you give it an empty value, that's an invalid declaration. It gets dropped per usual CSS rules. However, this is valid. And the value of the variable is a space. 
Also, unlike any other CSS property, variables are case sensitive. Eh. You can also do fallbacks. Uh, so the var function accepts a second parameter, which is the fallback to the variable. If the variable doesn't have a value, that's the value that is used. And you might be thinking, but wait a second, CSS already has a cascading mechanism that lets me do fallbacks. Usually, if, if, I, if I use two declarations and the second one is invalid, then it's dropped and the first one is used. And you, you would be right. For example, if, if, uh, if a browser doesn't support CSS variables at all, then our second declaration here would be dropped completely and you would get red as a background. However, there are some cases where, where, the, where the fallback in the var function works a bit differently. Let's say the browser does support CSS variables, but you have not set a value. There's no accent color set anywhere. It doesn't have a value. Or it's explicitly set to initial. In that case, we'll get orange, our fallback from the var function. And of course, if accent color explicitly has a value, either inherited or explicitly set, we'll get that, that color. So what, happen what happens if accent color does have a value, but it's something nonsensical for background, like 42 degrees? How many of you think it's going to be red? Show of hands. OK, none of you. How many think it's going to be orange? A few. How many of you think it's going to be something else? What color do you think it's going to be? Yes, transparent. The fallback doesn't apply if the, value doesn't, if the value exists, but it doesn't make sense in the current context. And the reason this happens is that, first off, by the time the browser realizes that this, this value is nonsensical, like I can't, use, I can't do anything with 42 degrees in the background, it has already thrown away red, so it cannot use that. It can also not use orange because accent color does have a value. So it falls into, a, into this new concept that we didn't actually have before CSS variables called invalid at computed value time. And what this does is the, uh, the property resolves to its initial value, which for backgrounds is transparent. So this is a new concept. If you write your CSS and, there's, and the declaration is invalid at parse time, yes, the declaration gets dropped and you get the previous one, the previous value. However, if, if we had 42 degrees in there instead of the value of a variable, yes, we would get red. If it's the value of the variable that makes the property invalid, we can't do that, so it just resolves to its initial value. So this, uh, uh, the fourth takeaway is that invalid at computed value time com always computes to initial. It's exactly the same as if you have specified the initial keyword explicitly, or if you knew what the initial value was and specified that. Another thing to keep in mind about uh, these fallbacks is that you can daisy chain them. The fallback for variable uh, for color one could be color two, whose, whose fallback is color three, whose fallback is red, which could be useful in some cases. Here is an example. Um, the, our HTML structure is just two divs. One of them has a class and the other one doesn't. We specified that on every div, its height is taken from the variable size, whose value is 8 m's. And we have a second class uh, whose, uh, whose colors are uh, inverted. That's just for styling. Ignore that filter. And we wanted to give it a slightly taller height. So we thought, you know what? I'm going to use size. And I wanted to make the, the height 50 pixels taller. So I'm going to get the value of the variable and add 50 pixels to it. And you might be surprised to find, especially if you're coming from a programming background, that this doesn't work. The reason this doesn't work is that CSS is declarative. It's not imperative. You don't have a series of commands. Size doesn't have a value that you can then add something to. It, 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 so it cannot refer to itself. Uh, the, so the way we uh, decided to solve this is that every time the browser detects cycles, every variable that is involved in these cycles computes to initial. It's basically invalid at computed value time. So it's essentially the same as if you've written this, which is exactly why we're not getting a height. 
So fifth takeaway, cycles make variables invalid at computed value time. You can't have steps. There is no before and after. They either have a value or they don't. So here's an interesting bit of code. The same two background declarations we had before. And we've set accent color to 42 degrees. And then we've set accent color to itself. How many think that the result is going to be red? OK, nobody. How many think the result is going to be orange? Nobody. How many think the result is going to be transparent? Quite a few. Sadly, you're wrong. <laughs> so what happens here, the first declaration is a red herring. It's overridden by the second. It's as if it doesn't exist. And then accent color is referring to itself. So it's a cycle, so it computes to initial. So if it computes to initial, it's exactly the same as if it, hasn't been, as if it hadn't been set. So you get the fallback, which is orange. But if you remove the invalid declaration and you leave 42 degrees, that's when you get transparent. So basically, having the invalid declaration there makes it use the fallback, which I thought was a bit odd and interesting. <laughs> you can use the at supports rule. If you want to apply, you can, as we've seen, there are fallbacks. You can use the cascade. If you want to do something more elaborate, depending on whether the browser supports CSS variables or not, you can use the at supports rule. Any rules you place inside here will only be executed by browsers that do support variables. You can also uh, write code specifically for browsers that don't support variables by using the not operator. But keep in mind, this will only be executed by browsers that don't support variables and support at supports, which is not that many. <laughs> so speaking of browser support, I know that many of you are thinking right now, whoa. When somebody, please think of browser support. All this stuff is cool and, and new, but like, come on, it's not supported everywhere, anywhere, right? I can't really use that in real projects, right? Actually, you might be surprised to find. <laughs> maybe not so surprised. That CSS variables are supported everywhere, even Safari, except Edge. And the, the ad supports rule is supported pretty much everywhere today. So at this point, you might be thinking, damn you, Microsoft. Why do you have to destroy my life uh, uh, all the time? I hate you. Why can't you just make a proper browser? However, Eva, I feel you, but that's not the right sentiment, because they're putting a lot of work into Edge. And actually, they have announced that they're working on supporting CSS variables, and it will be in the next version, unless something happens. I mean, you never know. But it's going to be in the next version. So soon, every single browser will support variables. And until then, I mean, Edge doesn't have a huge market share. You can use progressive enhancement. We've shown fallbacks. We've shown ad supports. So you can use them today, actually. Here's an example where I'm using viewport units to size a div based on, my, on the shape of my viewport. I wanted this div to have exactly 33% of my viewport. So I've given it 33% VH, 33 of the width of the viewport horizontally and 33% vertically. And as you can see, if I resize my window, this maintains exactly the shape of my viewport. So. Let's go back to full screen. If I wanted to change this to 30% th uh, of my viewport, I have to change it twice. That's not very dry code. So I might think, OK, I'm going to abstract this away into a variable, 30. And then this is very familiar to SAS users or any other preprocessor users. I would try to do something like this. And that's actually what I tried to do the first time I ran into something like this. And it didn't work. And I was like, why? Why doesn't it work? It, it works in SAS. It works in less. It, why doesn't it work in CSS variables? So actually, it, the reason it doesn't work is that variable values are token lists. The browser doesn't just see this as a 30 that, that it can put next to a VH, and it's exactly the same as if you're just outputting a 30 next to a VH. It's actually seeing a number next to, to an identifier that is VH. Essentially, it's seeing it as this, which, of course, doesn't work in width. It doesn't know what, what to do with an, a number next to an, uh, to an identifier. So it's just in, it's an invalid declaration. So what can we do then? Sorry? <laughs> 
sadly, there is no concatenation in CSS yet. But what we can do is we can use calc. And we can multiply our variable by one VH. <laughs> and that works. And we can do the same here. So you might be thinking, OK, what if I had, to avoid one calc, maybe I could have like 30 VH here uh, so that I can just have var here. And then inside this calc, I can just divide by one v, v, uh, VW and then multiply by one VH, and I should have the same thing, right? No. You cannot divide by lengths in calc, sadly. You can only divide by numbers. So you can go from a number to a unit by multiplying. You cannot go from a unit to a number. There's simply no way to do it right now. There will be, of course, eventually, but there is no way to do it right now. Which brings us to the sixth takeaway. You should use variables for pure data, not CSS values, not lengths, not angles. You cannot go from an angle to a number, or a length to a number, or a percentage to a number. You can go, however, from a number to any of these things. So many of you might be thinking about animations at this point. How many of you have experimented with CSS animations? Great, most of you. So you might be thinking, you, you know, CSS variables are cool, but you know what's even cooler? Animating them. So you might try to do something like this. Let's say that our background color is the value of the BG variable. And then inside the keyframes, I'm going to try to animate the BG variable. And as you can see, it doesn't work. What a party pooper that Chrome is. So actually, it's not just Chrome's fault that it doesn't work. Let's see what the spec says. CSS variables can even be transitioned or animated, yay. But there's always a but. Since the UA has no way to interpret their contents, they always use the flips at 50% behavior that is used for any other pair of values that, can be that cannot be intelligently interpolated, which basically means the browser doesn't know how to animate them, so it should just flip from one to the other. So what should be happening here is that we should see yellow, and then blue, and then yellow, and then blue, with no smooth transition, which is not very useful, but also it's not what's happening, because that's also a browser bug. The, the, the fact that this is not happening is a browser bug. But even, even if the browsers were complying to the specs, we wouldn't get an animation. So CSS variables and animations, chocolate ice cream. In the future, we will be able to declare uh, what type our custom properties are via JavaScript, unfortunately, which I don't quite understand. You're declaring your variables in CSS. You're animating them in CSS, but you're declaring their type in JavaScript. But OK, at least there will be a way to do it. And yes, you cannot animate variables, but you can use variable references in anywhere inside keyframes as well. So let's say we had two variables, color1 and color2, with our colors. And then here, we were animating background color. And we didn't want to write these colors, because maybe they were our theme colors. So you can do this, color2. This works. This works just fine. You see an animation. Everything's great. Also, transitions. So in this case, I have a very simple transition. When I'm clicking on the slide, it goes from yellow to blue. And even if I change this to a variable, let's say BG, and let's set background to BG, and then on active, I'm just setting the, the variable to something else. And as you can see, the, the animation still happens. So you might be thinking, wow, wait, we, can animate them. we can't animate them, but we can transition them? Not quite. So what's actually happening here is the variable itself is not transitioning, but it's triggering a transition on the background. So if I restrict my transition here to the variable, there's no transition anymore. But if I restrict it to background color, then I have a transition, because that's what's actually transitioning. So let's see some common use cases now that we've talked about the main syntax and the limitations. 
So this is a very common pattern. You have a component. It has some colors inside it. Other people use it. They want to theme it. So you tell them, override the CSS rules, or you declare specific classes uh, with preset themes that they can use. Here, we have like possibly the simplest component ever, just a button. It's a common flat design button. When you hover on it, uh, the text color becomes a background color, and the text color becomes white. And it has a theme already. Uh, if you give it a class of pink, it becomes a pink button. And basically, we had to override all these rules to create that theme. And we still don't have, we still cannot, if we, if we want to make a blue button, we have to repeat all these rules with and set all these colors to blue. So how can CSS variables help us with this? We can declare here that this is actually a color uh, the value of the color variable. Let's give it a value here. And we can replace black anywhere with a reference to this color variable. And now, all I have to do here is just set the color variable to pink. I don't even need this rule anymore. And it just works. So I've reduced my code by pretty much 75%. But it's not just about reducing code. What if I don't want to have these predefined themes? I can completely de delete this and go here and say, hey, I want a blue button. I can basically have infinite themes right now. Also, whoever is theming my component doesn't need to know what my CSS structure is like. Whereas without variables, they need to know how I've structured my CSS to be able to theme my component. Let's say, instead of using a background on hover, I didn't like this abruptness. So I wanted to use a transition coupled with a box shadow instead of a background. No offsets, no blur, and 1M spread. And it's an inset box shadow. So now I have this effect instead. And I can change how my component is styled without breaking anyone's code that is theming my component. So the eighth takeaway is that CSS variables enable theming independent of CSS structure, <coughs> which I think is pretty important. And that's one thing you cannot do with SAS. Also, oops. so note that I've specified my, the value of my variable here. That means that anybody theming my component needs to use higher specificity than what my rule is. And usually, it won't be just button. It will be a specific class. So that is kind of a hassle. It doesn't quite encourage people theming my component. So ideally, I need to use the second var argument for a fallback to specify what the default color is. But as you, might be, as you might be noticing, this is getting a bit repetitive. I have to repeat this fallback in three places. Now, I could use a variable for that, or I could basically define a new variable with this whole thing. And then, instead of color, I use this call variable, which is essentially the CSS equivalent of a private variable, because I'm not going to tell people about it. So I tell people, if they want to style my component, use the color variable, and they don't have to know about call unless they look at my code. And if they look at my code, they're on, my, they're on their own anyway. <laughs> so the ninth takeaway is that default default values are possible. And yes, I just made this up by just, using another, by just declaring another variable with your public variable and the fallback and using that internally. Another very common use of variables, a very pop a ve one of the design goals of CSS variables was responsive design. So in responsive design, we often have a gutter concept for our grid. And we use this gutter in a ton of places. Here, I've only used it as the margin. And you can see how it works here. But usually, we use it in a ton of places. And we have to repeat all these declarations in media queries. Here, I'm just setting the value of the gutter variable to something else in a media query. And it just updates. Uh, and let's see how this updates as my viewport size changes. You can see that if once my viewport becomes small enough, the gutter changes, and any rule that depends on it updates. So 10th takeaway, CSS variables make responsive design much easier. Now let's go to some cool use cases. <coughs> 
CSS variables enable us to set the value of multiple properties at once. Especi essentially, we can make our own aliases that set multiple properties, so we can use it for auto-prefixing, for example. So clip path is, a, is one of the, the properties that still require a prefix. And it really bothered me in, in those cases where I wasn't using auto prefix error or prefix free or something like that. So I came up with this idea. Basically, you cancel inheritance on your variable because you don't want clip paths to inherit. And then on the universal selector, you set both properties. And if your variable doesn't have a value, these compute to their initial value anyway, so it's as if they haven't been set. So let's see how this works. I will try to specify a diamond clip path on the first white element. Now, if this doesn't work, don't judge me too hard. Uh, it's kind of hard to write clip paths on stage, but I think, OK. Uh, and then 50% horizontally and 100% vertically. Yeah, this is working. And then 0%, 0 horizontally and 50% vertically, yes. And as you can see, thank you, as you can see, the clip path didn't inherit, which is most people's fear when they see this technique. Of course, if I want to apply it to the inner div, I can. I can apply it to any of the inner divs. I can apply it to all divs. It just works exactly the same as a clip path, except that I cannot animate it, because I've, as we've seen, CSS variables are not animatable, which is kind of sad, because it's pretty cool to animate clip paths. So CSS variables enable you to set multiple properties at once, which is pretty useful. Also, let's suppose you had a design with a lot of purple inset box shadows. One way would be to specify a variable with Rebecca purple inset and just use that in every box shadow declaration. A shorter way would be to use this trick, cancel inheritance, and then specify their box shadow is the value of purple shadow plus whatever part remains the same. So now every time you use purple shadow, you can use it exactly the same as any other property and only provide the extra values that you haven't specified in your first declaration. And it just works. I can even give it a spread and make it even more horrible. So basically, CSS variables enable you to create property shortcuts with pre-filled values. If, you, if, you, if you've ever heard about the concept of function carrying in, in programmeries, it's kind of like that. If not, don't worry about it. Also. CSS variables enable you to create your own longhands. Box shadow is an example of a property that really should be a shorthand, but it isn't. So many people want to set things like color independently. So we've, we've, defined, a, we've defined a bunch of variables. We've set box shadow to all of them. And as long as we set a blur, let's say 1M, blur, then we can set each of, each of these uh, each of these things independently. So let's say, on hover, I want my box shadow color to be red. And once I hover on it, it's red. I don't have to repeat the entire box shadow. I don't have to repeat the blur. So CSS variables enable you to create custom longhands, which is pretty useful as well. And one thing I always wanted was a prepend property so that I don't have to use pseudo elements. So here I've declared that the before pseudo element on every element is equivalent to the value of the prepend property if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it's as if I haven't specified content. So no problem with that. And as you can see, prepend YOLO just works. I can even put it on every div. I can even put it on the inline style, which might be useful in some cases. So CSS variables enable you to define your own properties. Now, let's see how CSS variables interact with SVG. This is a, a pretty short SVG of two eyes. The, the part we'll be interested in is these ones. It's, uh, uh, this is defining the circle that makes up the iris. And this is using it again for the second eye. And I have this CSS rule here that sets the center of the circle to something else. Are you feeling watched right now? <laughs> you should be. So as you can see, 
from 25 to 75 per, uh, pixels, it changes from watching to uh, watching the people on the right for, and watching the people on the left. So instead of having to remember which numbers it's using, I want to define a look variable that goes from 0 to 1. And let's initialize it to 0.3. Whoops. And here I can say calc 25 pixels plus the value of the look variable multiplied by 50 pixels, which goes from 25 pixels to, to 50 pixels. And now I can change this from 0 to 1, which is much more convenient. So CSS variables plus SVG equals love. And now on to the coolest part. CSS variables and JavaScript. So you can set and get CSS variables in JavaScript by using exactly the same methods you use to set other properties, except we don't usually use them because we have more convenient methods for normal CSS properties. But they would work. So there's element.style.getPropertyValue, which gives you the value of the variable on the inline style of the element. There is, um, you c if, if you don't want to just get the, value, the, the variable value from the inline style, but you also want to get the value of the variable regardless of whether it's inherited, set in the style sheet, then you use get computed style, just like any other property. And you use set property to set it on the inline style, which is usually what you want, so that's usually fine. Now, why is it get property value but set property and it's not get property and set property? I don't know. So let's start with an example of, uh, have of uh, differing CSS depending on the mouse coordinates. So we're setting the mouse coordinates based uh, to a value from 0 to 1 based on which part of the viewport, what, perc what percentage of the viewport our cursor currently is. And we're attaching this on, on the mouse move event. So every time I move my mouse, these, va these variables update. And since I've set them on the root element, the every I, I have access to them in every CSS rule in my style sheet. So here I have a radial gradient at the center, and let's make it move according to my mouse pointer. So now it moves horizontally according to my mouse pointer, and if I copy this and change the x to y, it will also move like anywhere I move my mouse pointer. And I can change the CSS now without having to change my JavaScript, which is very important in teams where different people write the JavaScript and different people change the CSS. And the, and the developers get really annoyed at the designers because they keep tweaking their CSS and bothering them. So now you don't have to worry about that. You can tweak your CSS as much as you want. And most importantly, these variables don't have to, t to be tied to your specific use case. Here, I can use exactly the same variable to make these eyes move as with my mouse pointer. It's exactly the same variable. Thank you. I can also set uh, a variable on the input event so that every time an input changes, uh, it's, it has a CSS variable called value in this case that also gets updated. So here I went through all, uh, input, all input elements, set, uh, initialized this variable, and then also listened to the input event and set the, value, the, the CSS variable again. And now I have this slider, it's just an input type equals range, which I've given it some light styling. And right now, nothing happens if I move it. But if I go here, rem in, remember in this case, my variable goes from 0 to 100. So I can have the value of the value CSS variable multiplied by 1%, because it already goes from 0 to 100, so it just needs the percent. And now, this works as I move the slider. It's not very pretty, but it works. And the last example, having CSS that varies as I scroll the container. So here I'm going through over, over all, the el all elements, and I'm setting a variable based on the percentage that they are scrolled. It's a variable from 0 to 1. So I calculate the maximum scroll and the current scroll and divide them. And what can I do with this? So here I have a scrollable container with a gradient. I'm going a little fast because I'm running out of time. And I multiply 100% by the value of the scroll variable. And as you can see, now as I scroll the container, this changes. And I can completely change the styling of this. I can give it a different background size and have it at the top and give it different colors. 
red, let's say red and white, and it works. I can even do something completely crazy, like uh, let's say I give it a background, a background color, and then I change the hue, and let's give it 100% and 80% lightness. And now let's see, will this work? Nope. Uh huh. Hmm. Oh, yes. Calc. Right. So, as you can see now, as I'm scrolling, the color changes. Like, I can do anything. And I don't need to change the JavaScript. So, the last takeaway. CSS variables are a revolution for separation of style and behavior. You, s you hear all these people using React, and they're all so enthused about it, and they're like, let's move all our CSS to JavaScript. Let's move all our HTML to JavaScript. Let's just move everything to JavaScript and have JavaScript consume the web. <laughs> CSS variables let JavaScript set exactly the parts that you, need it, that you need to vary, and then you can put your style exactly where it belongs in the CSS. So these are the URLs of the specs. The first one is the stable one. The second one is the editor's draft, which is the most frequently updated. And before I leave you, a, lo a little note about the near future. So CSS variables are the present. As we've seen, we're, they're supported pretty much everywhere. In the near future, we're also going to get mixins. Chrome supports them already, which is why I'm showing them today. They're behind the flag, but at least we have a browser that already added support for them. And these are basically multiple declarations that you can attach to any element. It's kind of similar to um, at extend in SAS. Sadly, so you, can, you, you, you define them by using kind of a custom property whose value is a CSS rule. And then you use them with at apply and the name of that rule. Sadly, if you decide to use a variable in here, let's say BG. No, that's the name of my mixin. Let's call it foo then you might expect that if you set foo here to something, let's say pink, then you would expect it to work. But no, the entire thing is invalid now, and you get red. If you set it here, it does work, because variables inside mixins resolve to the defining, uh, of the defo the resolve based on the defining scope, not the calling scope, which I think is kind of a mistake. Who knows? It might change or it might not. Because uh, if they resolved based on the calling scope, you could basically do mixins with parameters, which are much more powerful. So this is all I've had for you today. Uh, I hope some of it was useful. Uh, my slides are online on that URL. Not the latest changes, because uh, the Wi-Fi here blocks Git commits. But uh, my, my slides are on in there, and they also have a lot of examples of, of using CSS variables in the styling of the slides themselves. So if you want to see more examples, just look at the code styling these slides. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>